Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 36 of Own the Road with Auto Trader, where we make car stuff simple for Canadians. My name is Jody Lai, and I'm the editor in chief of Auto Trader. And I am Dan Alika, and I am Auto Trader's road test editor. So, as automotive journalists, yes. we get asked all the time hey, what's your favorite car? It's literally like the first thing that people ask me when they find out what I do for a living, and I never have a good answer for them because I always follow up with, well, what job is it for? Or like, how much money can I hypothetically spend, yeah. right? And so it's such a it's such an open-ended question. I never know how to answer it's it. It's also the question that we get when people are shopping for cars. Be like, oh man, I honestly don't even know where to start. Like, do you have any recommendations? And then... I'll be like, yeah, here are like three or five recommendations. And then they just buy something completely different. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, but I, I, I can't give you recommendations unless I get more information, right? So, what are you doing with it? Where are you yeah. driving? What is your lifestyle like? And what is your budget? I'll often instead uh, nowadays, I'll be like, you know, what? What are you considering? Yeah. Instead of being like, here's here are my suggestions to check out. Uh, because obviously it's like, I don't expect you to buy the one vehicle that I think you should buy. Obviously, you know, your taste, it could be style. It could be like Jody said, you know, the job that it's doing. Uh, but honestly, you know, I'm recommending them based on experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I've gone to this new way of being like, well, what are you considering right now? Because if it's like a big red flag, yeah. I'll be like, that thing is not the right choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we also have the Auto Trader Awards, which we come yeah. up with once a year. And it's those winners are picked by a jury of experts. And so our jury is is made up of a bunch of Canada's best automotive journalists, and we have an award for every single segment that's available. So there's like over 30 different Auto Trader awards. I'd even go so far as to say that they are the most comprehensive awards in Canada. Check. I agree. Um, the most trusted and the most comprehensive. Oh, yeah. And I'm not just making it up. We did a study. <laughs> Um, but today, Dan and I are really going to be talking about our personal favorite yes. vehicles and what makes them so good. Yeah, this is much less, you know, democratic. This isn't 20 plus uh, automotive journalists all voting and Andy Lynn, our production editor, crunching the numbers and coming up with the with the answers based on those. This is literally like Jody and myself saying, if I were shopping in these segments, this these are the vehicles I would buy. Yeah, and and often our answers are will be very different from yeah. what our jury picks simply yeah. because we have different lifestyles. You know, we don't have children. We yeah. both live in condos. Like there, it's just a different lifestyle. Yeah. And so these are like much more personal picks for us. Yeah. Um, and I happen to be driving a Porsche 911 right now, wow, and flex. it is like. My favorite vehicle flex. of all time. I'm just going to put it out there. I'm Why such, are you flexing? I'm such a 911 stan. Um, and it's also one of the ones, that's like my lottery car, you know? Like, I think when people ask me, what's your favorite car? I'll, I'll most often say a 911. That's the one that I dreamt of as a kid. That's the one that I've wanted my whole life. And every time I get to drive one, I feel like my dreams are coming true. Is this one manual? No, it's not. It's wow. automatic, but it's still so good. I'm driving the GTS one. Yep. And so they've stripped it out for weight savings. There's yep. no rear seat. It's just so good. It's so good. I'm in love with it. Um, what but what's your, is it? it's red, it's bright uh, red. Um, but what is your like lottery dream car? <sighs> if money was not an option. I mean, I think, it, also keep in mind, everyone, we're talking new cars um, because of course like that that could you know that list could could be very long um, so we're just talking about like brand new cars on the market uh the 911 is up there of course uh the Audi R8 is another one that's that's on that list uh but the more that time goes on the more I'm like yeah I would probably you know think at least think about electric yeah um, so the Porsche Taycan Sport Turismo, like the wagon, the, the wagon one, version. That one is on my list too. So yeah. I, I say I want a 911, yeah. but if I... But it's a was, lie. It's a lie because truly it does not fit my lifestyle. I need a vehicle with four comfortable seats. Yeah, but you won the lottery. Like you... 
Forget but four if you could only seats. have one car. Oh, yeah, right? that's a big... That's a big game changer. Yeah. So if I could only have one car in my one car garage and I won the lottery, yeah. I would probably end up picking something like an Audi RS6 uh, oh, yeah. Avant, which is a wagon. Ew, it's a please high don't use that term. A- everyone else out there, too, stop using this term Avant. They use... I, that's the official word for I it. Don't for care. Uh, for we're Audi. Not, we're not European. It's a wagon. It's okay? a wagon. It's a wagon. Um, it's so not either an that one or the one you mentioned. Uh, I also <laughs> really love the Panamera wagon, um, but I would probably get the plug-in hybrid version of that one. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. yeah, the RS6. That's another good... Yeah. See, that's the hard part, right? Is like these ideas hit you and then you forget about them. But I drove the new... RS6 performance. And you loved it. Oh my gosh. It was crazy. Dream car for sure because it combines practicality, performance, style. And hilarity. And hilarity. It's just absurd. Because it's very silly. Yeah. I personally love silly cars. Yeah. And, And like my favorite person in the world, RuPaul... When he tells someone, you're so stupid, that is like such a term of endearment because the sillier, the better, right? So the stupider a car, the more I like it. This car is a straight up idiot. (laughs) That Um, that car is stupid. That's like a, remember Will Smith in the, in like the first, in the pilot of Fresh Prince, he, he said that and, and like that it was a. Like a compliment and nobody else got it. Anyway. It is a compliment. Whenever I say something is stupid, it's usually a good thing. Um, but let's come down Except to Except for like, when it's me. Dan's just real stupid. She's like, he's stupid. I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, but let's come back down to like more practical terms, yeah. okay? So if you were to buy a three-row SUV today. Which one would you get? Now, I think we should also, again, like the qualifier that we're talking, you know, the ones people buy, like not the full size, not an ex- a Ford Expedition or a or a Chevy Suburban. I'm talking like, you know, three row, uh, like a Pathfinder or Highlander uh, or a Subaru Ascent, like that sort of style. If I were buying my, my, you know, one for myself today, I would probably say the... Toyota Highlander Hybrid. Great choice. Or uh, I haven't spent a ton of time with it, but the Toyota Grand Highlander Hybrid. It also comes with that that same powertrain because I just love the efficiency. It literally burns gas like a compact car. Like it's as efficient as a gas-powered Toyota Corolla sedan. That's amazing. Only you've got room for all kinds of stuff inside. It can even tow a little bit. It's rated at 3,500 pounds. Uh, but it's just good. It's like overall very usable. What about you? Um, you can't pick the same one. No, I won't. I'm going to try to pick something different. So a lot of our experts choose the Telluride for many good reasons. The Kia Telluride, because it's great. I feel like if I were to pick one, I feel like the Honda Pilot would be one of my top picks. They just came out with a new one. That's a lottery car. God, the price of that thing. It's these very days. expensive. Ooh. That's the only thing that kind of holds me back from it is that the pilot is expensive and it doesn't come as a hybrid. I can also finally take every time we like when Jody and I did a comparison between the Highlander and the Telluride and the Sienna and the Telluride, I always I kept forgetting to to say this. Uh so I don't think I've ever said this before. This is coming to you, you know It's fresh. This is this is an exclusive. <laughs> Uh, I think if the Kia Telluride was built by any other automaker, people would be less impressed with it. I think if Toyota or Ford or one of the GM, you know, brands I see where you're coming from. built that thing, people would be more apt to say, yeah, okay, but the seats aren't comfortable, but the materials inside, yeah. even in the top trim, aren't that great. But because it's Kia, everybody's like, oh, wow, like... This thing is great. Everyone loves an underdog story, right? But it's like at what point is the but at what point is that no longer true? And we went over this. The pricing of that thing has run away. It's not a value pick anymore. But I will say that a lot of people, I think, buy vehicles based on style and the Telluride looks cool. Yeah. Anyway, Dan and I will always disagree on matters of style, but that's why this is. No, that's not true. Just when it comes to that. The Telluride was a big, when we did our first comparison, we both thought, oh, we usually are pretty aligned in our We got into such a heated argument over this. I couldn't, I was shook. 
If you watch that video, go to go to the Auto Trader YouTube channel and watch that video. You can see my disdain for for Jody's thoughts and feelings on the Telluride throughout. Yeah, it's actually a pretty hilarious episode. Yeah. And it's funny because we you're right, we do normally agree on most yeah. things, but we were really split on that one. Okay, uh EV, if you had to buy an EV today, what would it be? Great question. So first of all, I don't think I could buy an EV because I live in a building that doesn't no, have charging. No, no, no. We're talking about just if you had to. My favorite one right now is probably the Ionic 5 because I think it looks the coolest. And that, to me personally, weighs a lot when I'm shopping Good luck for a car. surviving with no rear wiper. That is the biggest the downside. Dumbest, the dumbest, I honestly think the dumbest decision uh, in recent automotive history is taking a vehicle that clearly needs a rear wiper like the Ionic 5 and just you know, not even including it and then realizing after it was on yeah. sale, like, oh no. It's this also is a huge dumb mistake. because it's not a cheap car. No. Now, what that often comes down to, again, we talked about this in a previous episode, uh, is drag, mm -hmm. right? So the way that it impacts drag, they thought, oh, we can get away with getting rid of it. I drove that thing in the wintertime. And I remember there was rain X on the rear window, but it's, it's not a matter of the moisture. It's a it's matter of all that salt dust that kicks up yeah. on the back of the vehicle. It was an absolute mess. I love the Ionic 5. I would not buy one until the refresh hits and a rear wiper is included. I'm pretty sure that's coming because yes. they recently announced the performance version. So it's the Ion Hyundai Ionic 5N. Yes. And that one has a rear wiper. So I'm certain that it's coming to the next there one. There you go. Yeah. Now, if What's I... What's yours? So here's my thing. If the we're like just short of the fact that this answer would change... When the Volkswagen ID Buzz comes out, if it's as good as it looks, and uh, a dear friend and 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 colleague, uh, Andrew McCready, he drove it last year in Copenhagen and said it was amazing. And I trust his judgment. Uh, I look forward to finding out for myself. That is like high on my list. Until then, I honestly think I would buy a Volkswagen ID Four. I mean, that's a great pick too. It's got good range, good features. It's not perfect. Uh, charging speed wise. See, here's my thing. The Ionic 5 and the EV6, super cool that you can charge at 350 kilowatts on a DC fast charger. That's too fast. You're going to see battery degradation because those speeds are just so high. Yeah. The ID4, the, the new one that came, like, or refreshed one that came out in uh, for 2023, uh, it caps out at 170 kilowatts. It's fast enough. So the charging times are right, you know, down around like half an hour to go from 10 to 80%. That's not bad at all. Uh, but it's not fast enough that I think it's going to cause long-term yeah. damage to the battery. The other thing is that those really super fast chargers, very hard to find. Yeah. And every time I said this in the Nissan Aria, which I also really liked, except that it's incredibly overpriced, um, when you talk about those charging times, everybody, you know, you'll get these owners in the comments that say, well, I, I, cause I always say that's in ideal conditions and people will be like, I hit those conditions every time. I'm like, okay, listen, it's not that I don't believe you, but I have driven almost every EV on the mass market. Like I can't think of one that I haven't driven or that I don't have on my list of upcoming test vehicles. I have a lot of experience with EVs. And I use fast chargers a lot. I use different ones depending on where I am. It's very rare that the charging speeds ever cap out at the full, like at the maximum mm -hmm. potential. And the cool thing is I got the receipts, man, because every app <laughs> shows your charging history. That's right. And I seldom see these, these peak charging times. So I find it a little crazy and, and other journalists that I talk to, not just yourself, a lot of our contributors, a lot of people from, from rival publications, because we all get along uh, and we're all, we're all friends and we talk about this sort of stuff and we all have these same complaints. So I don't know where these, w these magical chargers that these owners are, are visiting exist. I'd love to be invited yeah. because I do not see, even, even in the Aria that, that maxes out at, I think 130 um, now I came pretty close. I was like 125, uh, which is still good. But, but the point being 
that like on a DC fast charger at a 350 kilowatt station in the Porsche Taycan, which is one that, that can max out up there. I don't know if that one hits 350, but it, it comes pretty close. Uh, and then I've driven the EV6 multiple times. I've driven the Ionic 5 and the Genesis GV60, all of which are built on the same architecture mm -hmm. and are supposed to max out at 350. I have not been able to do that. Anyways, just throwing it out Buyer there. beware, right? Like yes. it's just one of those claims that you have to be yeah. really aware of what, yeah. what it means and what, what is realistic. But anyways, the ID4, lots of range. I think it's very, it's very good. It's not perfect. It's got those stupid touch controls. The infotainment's a little weird. Um, but I think it's pretty good. Uh, especially don't, and I said this in the ARIA review, which you can check out on autotrader.ca slash editorial, uh, as well as our YouTube channel. Don't underestimate uh, or don't dismiss front wheel drive or even rear wheel drive EVs. I see a lot of that when I did the uh, Volvo XC40 and C40. You can get those in rear wheel drive now. And I had these people like, where in Canada would you feel comfortable? Anywhere. You just have to have a good set of winter tires. That is And key. use some common sense in the winter. That is it. And, and your range goes up. And the Aria is a great example of that. Both, you know, on paper and in practice. The Aria that I tested was supposed to have, I think, 465 kilometers because it was the front-wheel drive version. The all-wheel drive, a, a kind of close uh, equivalent all-wheel drive version maxed out at 428 my real, real, I kept saying this, my real world numbers, 540 kilometers. That's really impressive. Front wheel drive, slap some winter tires on that bad boy and you are, range anxiety is in the rear view. That's amazing. Love it. I love that. Yeah. Um, if you were to buy a subcompact SUV today, which one would you get? Subaru Crosstrek. Oh, great choice. One yeah. of my great friends just bought one. Smart. And loves it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just drove the the 2024 not too long ago. It just, it's, it's one of those classic cases of everything is better. It's also one of those rare cases we talked about on the last episode or two episodes ago when we talked about design and how rare it is for, for vehicle dimensions to stay static. The Crosstrek is one of those vehicles. If you looked at it dimensionally and even stylistically, you'd be like, oh, this is an update. This isn't a new generation, right. but it is new. It's just that, hey, it's already a good size. Why make it Yeah, and they bigger? had the benefit because the Crosstrek was already uh, so Very much good. bigger than everything yeah. else it competes with. So it yeah. didn't need to keep chasing yeah. that space. Yeah, so I really, I think if I were, if I were in the market today for a subcompact crossover, I think the Subaru Crosstrek would be the one. What about I like you? that. Um, well, if I can't say the same thing, I would probably say the Kia Seltos with the turbo engine. Yeah, that's pretty good. I like it because it's punchy, it's small, it comes in a bunch of fun colors, it looks good, yep. very user-friendly, still quite affordable in terms of like, you know, rest the rest of Kia's lineup is kind yeah. of a bit more expensive, but the Seltos is still yeah, pretty that's good. Yeah, a good one. Yeah, that's the one I'd pick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about, whoa, favorite low-key sleeper car? I thought I would throw in an interesting one because we don't have an Auto Trader Award category for low-key sleeper car. Right. So to explain that, that, that means something that doesn't, it looks pretty unassuming, but it offers something kind of special in terms of like performance or something else. Okay. I mean, can we say the Audi RS6, even though we just said that off the top about a... I would think that's a because sleeper. Because that, that to me yeah. is one of those vehicles where, uh, yeah, I mean, it's got the wide body and the big grill. Like you but can it's a wagon, tell, so yeah. people won't look at it and be like, that. that's a cop magnet. Yeah. But it that thing just, like, it is, it hauls. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you said a really good one uh, earlier this year when you drove the Volvo S60. Oh, that was a really good car. The S60 Recharge. Plug-in hybrid, so it had, I don't remember what the range was, 40-some-odd kilometers of all-electric range. That is one of those cars, uh, if there was a, I don't know if this is one of them, if, if I had to buy, like, a, a premium sedan today, that would probably be it. I wouldn't buy a BMW 3 Series mm. or a Mercedes C-Class. Um, that thing is very good. Yeah, and I think you said you liked it because it it looks it's just very unassuming. Yeah. It looks like a regular it's also Volvo got so sedan, much room but it's like fast. I, it was a very good car. Yeah. Another one that isn't 
you know, it's it's a little more sinister, but it still kind of counts, uh, especially if it's done up the right way, is the Cadillac CT5V Blackwing. Oh, that car is so special. <sighs> Manual transmission. Rear wheel drive, oh, supercharged V8. Just a beast. But like, if you look at it from a distance, especially I've seen some colors where it's like, you know, the black even, like black with the carbon fiber trim, from a distance, you're like, oh, it's just a Cadillac. Yeah. But that thing is that I said in the video that is the closest thing to a Corvette sedan that we will ever see. That car is actually brilliant. Yes, it's yeah. amazing. And it's really cheap for what it is. Like I yeah. think it starts in the 80s. It's way it competes with like an M5 and stuff, but yeah. it's like way 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 cheaper. Yeah, really good car. Um and I feel like it's a lot more special because you don't see very many of them yeah. around, right? Um but it's very cool. Love that car. Uh okay. What is your Truck of choice. If I were to buy a truck today. Wait, okay. L let's do three, two, one, and we'll see if what I think your answer would be is the actual answer. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Three, three two, two, one. one. Ford Hyundai Maverick. Santa Cruz. That was my oh, second that's, choice. That's, that's, <laughs> okay. We're on the same page. So the Ford Maverick hybrid yeah. is my, it was my second choice. I love that truck because it is so fuel efficient yeah. and it has all these really great, like clever features. It's a right sized truck. Like yeah. it's a small truck, yeah. but for my lifestyle, I feel like it is absolutely perfect. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think, and I'm not a big, uh, we've talked about this on the podcast, in our reviews, uh, in our videos, like I'm not a big fan of people buying half tons just for the sake of it. Yeah. I'll, but if I'm just talking about this, you know, kind of non-existent scenario, if I were <laughs> shopping for a pickup truck, the Ford F-150 hybrid uh, oh. And you know, I love that onboard inverter. So the truck works as like a generator. Uh, so you can power a job site. You can plug in your trailer if you get the 7.2 kilowatt inverter. Uh, and, you know, so that means most importantly, you can keep your beer in the fridge cold while you're on your way out to a, you know, campground. Because the big thing for me, I, I really like the F-150 Lightning. But as soon as you put a trailer on the back... The range just the range just drops. You know, our friends at at TFL Truck did a did a test and it failed so miserably, um, and that's why to me the hybrid really kind of is the best of both worlds, where it can tow when you need to tow, but it's fairly efficient. Like you can get sub ten liters per hundred kilometers, and have that. I plugged a microwave in. That's incredible fuel efficiency for a half ton truck. That's very good. Like the only time I've ever been able to do that in a truck has been a diesel. Right. Uh, ironically, it was the Silverado or the, C no, GMC Sierra that I actually really like. And, and that, if it, if it had more features in terms of stuff like, you know, that hybrid powertrain, that would be higher on my list because I think it is underrated from a comfort perspective. Mm -hmm. People ask me that a lot. I th I know like Ram, you can get air suspension. Ford has the adaptive dampers. The even like a kind of mid grade GMC Sierra or Chevy Silverado, in my opinion, has the best ride quality of any other half ton truck on the road. Uh, but they they come up a little short in some other areas. So I think that F one fifty hybrid would be the one that I would buy. Great pick. Yeah. Um, if any of you would like to share your favorite cars, your personal favorite cars yeah. with us, you can email expert at trader.ca. We also, you know, an important category that we didn't do. Uh huh. We did subcompact crossover. We didn't do compact crossover. And that's, that's like true. That's the like biggest segment in Canada aside so from important. Yeah. yeah. So what would yours be? Um, good question. I really enjoyed the Mazda CX-50. Okay. Um, because I like the way it looks and I like the way it drives. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like the infotainment system would be a bit of a deal breaker for me. Yeah, no touch screen. No except touch screen. for when you're using Apple CarPlay and Android Auto when you're stopped Yeah, or it doesn't make sense. But I do really like the Kia Sportage hybrid. Or the Sportage, as they call Sportage, it. if you're American. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would go with the Subaru Outback. Oh, you used to have one. I used to have one and I loved it. Yeah. I'm not, same sort of thing. I'm not crazy about the touchscreen. Uh, 
in the new one, but it's been updated. It functions a little better than than before because it has that big, what is it, 11.6 inch vertical uh, screen. But it's just like, it's good, it's roomy, it's easy to drive. You can get it in some fun versions like the the Wilderness. So it's got a couple inches of extra ground clearance and some, some off-road tires. I've done some pretty crazy four-wheeling in the Outback, so it's underrated from that perspective. I think it's really good. Uh, yeah. Super practical. Favorite. So practical. And now it actually looks cool. I, I feel like the Outback cool. didn't always used to look cool, but now, whoa, whoa, whoa. especially that whoa. Wilderness one, it looks really good. Yeah, it good. does look really good. I, I dig it a lot. Yeah, cool. Great picks, Dan. Um, Thanks, Jotes. <laughs> before today's Ask an Expert, so X, I can't even say it properly. You do it. Before this week's Ask an Expert, uh, here's a message from the good folks at Auto Trader. Save time and money by using AutoTrader, Canada's most trusted place to buy and sell new and used cars. AutoTrader has the most cars and one of the best features is price badging so you can feel more confident that you're getting a good deal. Okay, today's Ask an Expert comes from Andy. What's up, Andy? Have you noticed recently that there seems to be more people on the road who have their turn signal on and never turn? Or worse, make a right turn from the center lane. Oh, that's a big one. That bothers me. I told Jody this story once. I don't know if I told it on the podcast before, but I was driving out to a shoot one day. And there was a guy in front of me in a PT Cruiser. And he turned into like the left turn lane ahead and had his signal on. And then at the last minute changed his mind and turned right from the left turn lane across the lane of traffic that I was traveling in to make a right hand turn. I I saw this happen. Uh, there was a bus that was pulled over picking up people. Yeah. Um, and instead of waiting behind the bus, like a normal responsible driver, this guy made a right turn from the center lane and the bus had to slam on the brakes and all the people in the bus went flying. Not cool. Can you imagine being T-boned by a bus because you couldn't be patient enough to wait an extra 30 seconds? That's ridiculous. Yes, that is ridiculous. But I have noticed people doing that. And yeah, the turn signal thing, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, electric power steering versus hydraulic steering where, you know, that kind of like click lever when you would make your turn and then, you know, turn back and it would, it would click back, uh, nowadays. And, and then I find back in the day when it was like, like my Miata, it still had that really like clicky sound when the signal was on. Whereas now sometimes they're so quiet you can barely hear it. that you can barely hear it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was guilty of it recently. I was driving an EV and, uh, I had the music on and I like change lanes and I guess, cause I'll just use like the tap where you get like, th- yeah. you know, three or five flashes to indicate that I'm changing lanes. But I guess I, had, you know, used the full signal and not noticed it. And then it was like 30 seconds later, I was cruising along and I was like, oh man, my signal's on. How embarrassing. Oh, I was so, so ashamed. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for your question. If any of you would like to ask Dan or I some questions, you can email expert at trader.ca. Uh, Thank you for joining us on this episode. Drive safe and we'll see you next time. Bye guys.